bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Hey, welcome to this Family Bible Study Hour. Book of James, how I enjoy it. James, of course, being the equivalent of the Hebrew Jacob, which was the father of the 12 tribes. And in verse 1 of chapter 1, this great book of James, James addresses this book to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. So, for those 10 tribes and part of the other two that were taken captivity in captivity with them in the land of Samaria, over the Caucasus Mountains, later becoming Caucasians as they were scattered among the world, this is written to you. Naturally, every Christian can gain from it, but you must note at the same time who it is addressed to, or it could confuse you a little bit. He has told us um, so far in this book that to be a hearer of the word and a doer of it is what pleases our Father. And we had just closed with that 22nd verse of chapter 1, and it, it had read, But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Because that's what it will do. If you just absorb without doing it, what happens? You get no blessings. That's, it, it is very misleading for people to say, you don't, your works don't amount to anything. That's not true. That's what brings the blessings of God upon his children. As in that famous chapters in the Gospels of he knows every sparrow that falls and he dresses uh, the very flowers of the valley far more beautiful than even Solomon or David was uh, dressed. And he said, you do these things, don't worry, and so forth, and I will add all these things unto you. In other words, after the doing, he does the blessing. All right, got it? With that thought in mind, let's ask a word of wisdom from our Father, and let's pick it up, chapter 1, verse 23. Let's go with it. And if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his, na beholding his natural face in a glass. Now, this word glass in the Greek means mirror. In other words, it's like in the morning when you wake up, you look in the mirror, perhaps you're getting ready to shave the, the other gender, you simply look in that mirror and you see what? You see an image. You're seeing, and then what happens to the image as we're gonna, well, let's cover 24 and then we'll come back to it. I want you to picture that so far. It's kind of like a man walking up and looking in the mirror, if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, and looking in a mirror. Verse 24, for he beholdeth himself, he sees himself in the mirror, and goeth his way, he walks away, and straightway, that means immediately, forgetting what manner of man he was. In other words, the moment he walks away, that picture fades away. There's nothing there. And so is your mind. If you do not, as you hear God's Word, put it to practice in your life with faith to know, hey, it's true. It works. This is where true knowledge is at. This is how I receive the blessings of God, and everything works to my benefit. All right? Okay, so he looks in the mirror, sees himself. At the same time, let's go just a little deeper in this. What can self do for you? When you're not a doer of the word, you're really leaving everything hanging on your own self because God's not going to help you. Uh, did you hear what I said? God, if you just hear the word and you're not a doer, God is not going to help you, so you'd better look at yourself because that's all the help you're going to get. All right? Now, watch this. Verse 25. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, what is this? And instead of looking into the mirror at yourself, to look into the perfect law of liberty, what's that? The New Testament, God's truth, the old and the new, as they are combined, that gives you the liberty from the law, all right? Or gives you or set you free from the law in as much as it is like a ball and chain where we are in the flesh, all sin and fall short, and it convicts us to hell. 
in Christ, when we look into the Word and we study this Word, it goes into your mind, then what happens? When he looketh into the perfect law of liberty, that's the gospel, and continueth therein. Oh, hey, did you hear that? And continueth. He continues looking therein, continues studying it. He being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. He's going to be blessed indeed for certain. There is so much in that that I can attest to. If you look in the Word, as he has said earlier in this very chapter, God will bless you and you will be able to absorb that wisdom from his word. And instead of looking in a mirror at yourself and depending on yourself for salvation, if you'll get into the word of God and look into it, then it literally imbues itself in your mind whereby um, that you can recall those truths as you need them, God's promises, because he'll keep them, regardless of what trouble you might get into. Whenever you repent, ask his forgiveness, and get yourself straightened out. In other words, the wisdom and the knowledge. I can attest even to this fact, and perhaps I shouldn't, and many may call it a digression, be that as it may. I spend a great bit of time, I have in the last 40 years, in studying the scriptures. And I suppose I would have to say it was a gift from God because looking into this, this uh, law of liberty, the law that makes me free, then if I'm talking to you, but after having spent all that time looking into that law, the scripture, then literally if you ask me a question concerning a scripture or a place, that page comes into my mind. And I can actually see the word and pick out the scripture that I'm looking for, chapter and verse. Sometimes it's a little vivid and if you see me go like this, I'll, gi I'll give myself away. I see the page and I will say, well, it's approximately seven or eight verses down into it literally seeing that page. So the image does not go away as your face does in the mirror. But it, the very truth itself, the wisdom from God, as, as he promised that he would give it. And that, um, in other words, back, it, it was back in verse 5. It says, if any man of you lack wisdom, let him ask God that giveth to all men liberally. liberally and uh, doesn't uh, make light of or anything, okay? So it does help you. That's why you do study the word, being a hearer, but not only a hearer, a doer, and share that with others, being a doer of the word, whatever that word may be, if it be your gift or your feel. And I certainly... Um, I do not want everyone to think I'm not really hearing the Word of God until I look up and I see a page from the Bible. Now that's a gift, and I can't promise that everybody's going to receive a gift like that, all right? Uh, being a teacher, it's very necessary, and it's a wonderful gift that God has given me to be able to communicate that law of liberty, His Word, His Gospel, to help others. But it will stay in your mind and keep you out of trouble, and who knows? He could make a teacher out of you. He can give you. If you ask, he will give that wisdom. And some are going to say, well, what wisdom? Well, we were, I was teaching over 15 or 20 years ago that we were going into a new world order. Why? The Bible says so. There were no prognosticators in the open field of, of the world that could predict that, that could know that. But the prophets of old prophesied it, that after the parable of the fig tree, that this would come into existence very soon after that, within that generation. 
It's very simple to have that wisdom in the simplicity in which Christ teaches. If you only stop and think for a moment, any business person could tell you if you know what the future brings, if you know what tomorrow brings, if you use a little of the gray matter, you can be successful in almost anything you set out to do. It can be a great help. Thus, one of the ways God brings blessings. So don't just be a hearer. And look, because you're counting on yourself when you don't do, when you don't take God up on his challenge, I'll call it that, I hope you understand, then you're going to sit in one place all your life being a doubter. All right, verse 26. If any man among you seem to be religious, now th this is given in, in a pious way. If he seems to be really religious, likes to go through the rituals, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. In other words, if, his, if he is a, well, let's say a preacher, he can seem also pious, and he can carry the book, and he can read the book, but if he does not practice and teach all of that word, his ministry and his own religion is vain because he only covers those, par those parts that maybe you would put on with a powder puff, you know, the sweet sayings, because he is, after all, so very religious. A true teacher of God's word teaches all the word, whether it takes whether it uh, injures or whatever, to, to even himself. He's going to teach that word and be loyal and true to Almighty God. And I assure you, that is not vain. Vain means it's empty. But God's word is full. It's pregnant. It grows each time you cover a book. Each time you get into it, there are more blessings there. And God will bless your life if you are a hearer and then a doer. It may be that what you do is simply to plant a seed occasionally. That pleases your father so very much because sooner or later you're going to touch one of his precious children. You're going to help someone. And God loves that. Next verse will document that fact. Verse 27. Remember, that one that is so pious, you can't really be bothered. His religion is empty, even though he looks like he may wear the robes, turn around collar, and the whole bitch, you know. But it's vain. Now listen to this. 27. Pure religion and undefiled before God. Now what are we talking about? We're talking about pure religion religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this. This is your answer. To visit the fatherless, that's orphans, and widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. That is to say, to no prophecy and so forth, the appearance of the false Messiah and so forth, that you are not wrapped up in that religious philosophy that can bring about deception. That's true religion. That is the doctrine that Jesus Christ taught. Stay away from vanity, my friend. Do it by being a doer, participating in a ministry that God has blessed is a great advantage as far as blessings that flow. Okay, now, um, it is important as we continue that we bear in mind, yes, God divorced Israel. He did. What is it? Jeremiah chapter 3 in part, uh, one of the places where he divorced Israel was Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 8, I believe it is. And uh, but he remarried her through this law of liberty. And it's important that you take that into consideration as you look into both the old and the new. For it is not a law that uh, change you or 
brings you into bondage other than the love of God, but that does set you at liberty free. Chapter 2, verse 1, My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. And um, what it's really saying here is with this faith that Christ has given us through his word, faith to know and to understand that we are to care for the, the widowed and so forth in the very church itself, that we are to be considerate of them, that we do not with that faith and works become a respecter of a person. That means, uh, quite frankly, to treat the to treat those that are blessed better than those that are not blessed. Let's let him say it. Verse 2. For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring. Woo, look at that mama. Woo, look at that ring. In goodly apparel, whew, nice suit. And there come in also a poor man in vile raiment. He's got a pair of overalls on and he, you know, uh, what? Well, we might call, like some might say about some of us foreign people, looks like a clodhopper, all right? What you do, you don't treat them any different, all right? You love them the same, all right? Verse 3, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and you can be assured, some, oftentimes it is gay clothing, you know, the fancy suit and ring, and say unto him, sit Thou here in a good place. Sit up front here close to me, all right? And say to the poor, stand thou there. Get it back over there in the corner, kind of out of sight, all right? Or sit here under my footstool, all right? You don't do that, beloved. We're all children of God, all right? So it is important. It's very important that you always remember that if you are, I don't care if you're a greeter at the door, are just a member of the congregation. One of the most admirable things of a Christian is to recognize and treat the brethren as they are our brothers and sisters. I don't care what their profession and I don't care what their way of life. They're God's children and they're your brothers and your sisters. And yes, many times you might to uh, really know the word and be a doer of it and be so blessed that your cup runneth over, but still take time. Remember back how it was and love all of God's children in that respect, all right? That especially goes to the church, all right? It seems that some churches like to divide the people up into groups like, you divorced people sit over here you rich people, you know, if you're paying so much for these pews here, that's your family pew. You'll live, you'll be born there, carried there, and die there, okay? And if even one of the divorcees in this, they move over to join these and so on and so forth, okay? Kind of divide, don't, don't, hey, we're all God's children. And when someone is trying, when they're reaching out, when they're striving for the truth, for the word, they're the same. I don't care if it's a homosexual, a prostitute, uh, or who it is that's striving to hear the word of God, to become a child of God in good standing. Friends, you better have time for them, all right? By that I mean don't treat them any different in the class room where the word is taught than anyone else. First, do you understand? They're God's children. Now, don't anyone read anything into what I have said there. I said anyone that is trying, you as a teacher or simply as a Christian had better be willing to at least give a helping hand. Got it? Verse 4. Are ye not then partial in yourselves and are become judges of evil thoughts? This would go back to that double-minded person. If you separate people 
then you're just a little bit double-minded because you've set yourself up as a judge and it is God that will judge you. Verse 5, hearken, my beloved brethren. And, and I want you to note that word brethren in love, all right? Hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised to them that love him? In other words, the qualifications of your heritage is your faith and your love of God, not your standing in blessings or other things, however it is connected. And uh, it has nothing to do with rich people that are rich with the blessings of God. More, more uh, we should all respect the fact that God so loves them that that he considers them worthy of a special blessing, but I'll guarantee you one thing, they won't act any different than anyone else when it's the blessings of God that has made them wealthy. Got it? Again, very important. What causes you, God, you know, our Father owns everything. You want to talk about wealth for a moment? Your Father owns everything there is in existence on this planet or any other planet. In the heaven or on the earth or under the earth, he owns it all. And you stand in a position to inherit it. All right? You're part of it equally. That's what the promises are. He promises you. As a matter of fact, this is a testament. This word, this Bible, the Old and the New Testament is a will. And when Christ died, the will was already put in action and you can already begin to inherit part of your inheritance. Not all, but part in blessings. If you're a hearer and then at the same time a doer. Certainly, you never have to apologize for the gifts of God. They're a blessing. But as I stated, it's very easy to tell the difference in that person that is overwhelmingly blessed by God's gifts in this earth age, in this flesh body, because they would never treat you any differently as long as you behaved yourself and so on and so forth as that, did not make a fool out of yourself, then anyone's going to uh, stand apart from you. But here we see the promise of his inheritance is given to them that love him. Why do they love him? Because they have faith in him to know he is our father and the love through the son of what he accomplished for us. Verse 6. But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? In other words, this is not talking about one rich in the blessings of God. And I know it may sound like repetition, but it is so easy. To, in other words, this word draw, let's translate it drag. Have you ever been, if someone ever drug you down, he drags me down or she drags me down? Let's read it with that so you get a better understanding. But ye have despised the poor. Do not the rich men oppress you and drag you before the judgment seats? No, they'll do it. They don't care. They have no compassion. That is those that are rich through their crooked acts in this world. All right? There's a far cry difference between those and one rich with the blessings of God. In other words, what he's saying here, you're acting just like they do. If you judge men by what they have rather than what they have outside rather than what they have inside. Got it? Verse 7. Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by the which ye are called? What are you called? A Christian. Christians don't do that. They're full of forgiveness. I know we all fall short and there's none of us perfect, but my friend, there is no way that you can be, you can truly live a Christian life because if you live a Christian life, you're going to live a happy life. If you do not possess forgiveness, you cannot be. 
a Christian in its fullest. You're going to be very unhappy. Forgiveness is something that every Christian possesses, every full Christian that is, even if you wrong them a little bit accidentally or are confused and do it on purpose. And you go to that person and repent, they're going to give you the real thing, real forgiveness. They're going to say, it's all right, I love you. And it, they're going to mean exactly what they say. That's Christianity in practice, and that's what Christ paid the price for you to possess, that you can possess that forgiveness when a brother or a sister falls short because God only knows you have enough times that you can say, it's all right. Because I don't know anybody that has a perfect brother or sister. Yeah, they fall short, and you forgive them because you love them. And I don't know of anyone that truly is a practicer of forgiveness that even in forgiving you get blessed more in your heart than they do. God kind of sees to that. So if you're going to wear and be called by that name, be a doer of it. Practice it. Verse 8. If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, what is the royal law? Our father is the, is the king of kings through the son and lord of lords. Both the old and the new testament is the royal law according to the scripture. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You do well. Hey, that's good if you do that. You can live by the whole law and as long as you'll do that, Love your neighbor as yourself. You're pretty quick to forgive yourself, right? Mm, I messed up that time. Run over the neighbor's cow. Oh, well, it was an accident. I really didn't mean it. It just happens that way. Well, until you, you go to the neighbor, if he runs over one of your cows, what are you going to think, huh? Naturally, you want to go ask forgiveness and set it straight, all right? Do your neighbor as you like to be done. You do real good in that. That's, that's the old law. It's also new. Verse 9. But if ye have respect to persons, you commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. In other words, uh, I suppose I should say, um, instead of convinced, let's say convicted, and I think you'll understand that better, but if you have respect to persons, if you treat that old boy with the gold ring better than the other one, you commit sin and are convicted of the law as transgressors. God doesn't like it, all right? Now, if God doesn't like it, well, it seems such a little thing. I mean, he's really a friendlier guy. It's real easy to lie to yourself that way. The one with the gold ring is just easier to be happy with. <laughs> oh, really? Stop and think, my friend. Are you a judge? They're both your brothers. You can be convicted by the law. And you see, what's very serious about this is this. If you do that, even... Um, unconsciously you do it. You're not aware of it. You're a transgressor. Do you think for one moment that God blesses a transgressor? What am I saying to you? God won't bless you. I want you to be blessed. And many people, uh, I mean, some may wonder, well, why do you speak on this vein so often? Because I have hundreds of requests, why does God not answer my prayer? That's the reason. He's not going to bless anyone, <clears throat> excuse me, that would be guilty of this sort of thing wearing the name Christian. You've got to be honest with him, beloved, and you've got to be honest with yourself. Rather than looking into a mirror so much, and looking at that person to carry you through, get in the scriptures and know that God doesn't mess around. He will carry you through. He will bless you, and you'll be happy.
That's what we want, all right? Because I love you, I want you to be happy. Verse 10, for whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. In other words, if you um, feel that you must live by the law rather than the perfect, beautiful liberty of the law, which is to say Christ price on the, pri the cross on repentance buys you freedom, sets you free at liberty. If you misjudge or if you judge between two different people in that respect, you're guilty of breaking every law. Listen to this, verse 11. For he that said, do not commit adultery, and also do not kill. Now if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. In other words, you can do it one way or the other. Are they the same equivalent? Well, I would hope not, because this word kill is really, it can only be translated from the Greek, and uh, I apologize that it isn't here, is to be a murderer, for it is fanyo, which comes from the prime fanyance, which is to say criminally com breaking and committing homicide, to lie in wait and plan a murder of an individual. God doesn't like that. Christ used the same word in Matthew 5, and you have these stooges that wear the the religious attitudes at times saying capital punishment really shouldn't be when Christ says it should be because they, are, they do not understand. They are willing to take this word kill without looking into the scripture to find that in the Greek it is fanyance, fanyo to fanyance on the prime whereby they know what they're talking about and when they are supposed to represent God, they do it correctly rather than 180 degrees out of balance, all right? Again, I'm making that point so that you know it's better to look into the Scripture than what you hear and then be a doer of it. Verse 12, so speak ye and so do. In other words, speak it and do it as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. That is to say, by the new covenant. Hear it and do it and ask forgiveness. God loves you. You know, I know many might say, well, that capital punishment, that is so severe. I'm going to tell you something. Somebody goes out and they take a teenage child and rape them, beat them to death. That's murder. Do you think they worried a whole lot about capital punishment? They, God wants them dispatched to him. That's his orders. That's his command. That's the command that Christ gives in the Greek in Matthew chapter 5. Because God states, these things shall be seen and they will cease to happen among you. Greatest deterrent to, to uh, that is, of course, as God stated, publicly done. Okay, verse 13. For he shall have judgment without mercy, that hath showed no mercy, and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. It triumphs over it. Mercy will. Why? Mercy from Christ. He that paid the price on the cross, whereby we can enjoy that mercy. Be careful. Judge people with mercy if you must judge, but it is better that you judge not at all and let love supersede even the necessity of using the word choose carefully your friends. In the, in the congregation, uh, you're really choosing your friends, that's, that's well, but to as to how you treat people in the assembly, that, that falls under a little different. They're to be treated the same and use mercy in doing so. 14, what doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and hath not works? Question, that's a question. Can faith save him? 
Now this is other than initial justification. That is to say, I want to be saved and, and capitalize on that or accept it. But this means after you are a mature Christian, simply to say you have faith, we're going to go through a method here that's going to tell you exactly how you can tell whether someone does have faith or not. Verse 15, if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, that is to say if they be lacking, and uh, verse 16, and one of you say unto them, depart in peace, be you warmed and filled, notwithstanding, you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Well, I'll pray for you. Couldn't you give them a biscuit? Hmm? Which do you think is going to help them more in this case? Your prayers? Done in this way, so pious and very religious or a biscuit with God's love. That's what he's saying. Now listen to me. We're going to a deeper vein. What is the famine of the end times as it is written in Amos 8? It's for doing the very same thing we covered earlier. For rather than looking in a mirror at yourself and seeing self, Look into the scriptures, the word of God, for as it is written in Amos chapter 8, the famine in the end times is not for a biscuit, not for bread, but for hearing the word of God, the true word. Therefore, there are many starving in this world today. Do we have too many people playing church? Well, I won't judge them. But have you attended them? Do they feed the word of God there? Or is it the words of men and traditions? I don't know. You do. You judge. But if you truly have faith, you will see that the real word is taught. And you will participate only where that takes place. Because God's blessings flow from his own word and not the words of men, taught boldly and straightforward whereby any one of the brethren in love can understand. Then that's giving that one what they need to sustain themselves in this generation. I want to go one more verse here. Verse 17. Even so, faith if it hath not works, is dead being alone. In other words, he's likening that. A starving person comes up and you said, yes, I'm a good Christian, I'll be praying for you, just go off over there in the ditch and starve. Now, is that a Christian act or not? No, it isn't, of course. Unfortunately, beloved, there are many starving people that some of you that know better participate in a group that is not feeding the starving. I'm not talking about biscuits now. I'm talking about the law of liberty. You're not seeing that that word, the true, chapter by chapter and verse by verse, there are many that do, and God will bless you. But you better think about it. Again, I receive many questions. Why doesn't God answer my prayers? Could it be? Could it be that any one of these things that we've spoken of today, might, you might fit in that category because he said, hey, as far as I'm concerned, if you judge people and if you don't see that my law of liberty is taught and become a doer in it, you don't have faith. What you call faith is dead. Now, this is a little um, somatic, somatic, somatic. It's a little word game with preachers. You know, you don't have to have works to judge where you're fighting, you're fighting, and your works. Hey, if you don't do any work, you ain't got no faith, friend. You're dead. And sin brings death. 
Think about it. Be a doer. Be a can-do type person. And wear the name Christian proudly. And don't take a back seat to anybody because you're royalty. You're a child of the king. Dumb. It's partly yours when you claim it. All right, bless your heart, you listen to me.